All right. Good afternoon. Uh, we made it to like 4 o'clock on the, on the last day of a conference. I'm really happy to be here, and I'm really glad to be talking to you all this afternoon about, um, about text mining and about natural language processing. And I'm going to be talking about um, text mining from a particular perspective. I'm going to be talking about applying tidy data principles to text mining. And what I want to do here today is to make the argument that Using a suite of tidy tools and using tidy data principles can make text mining easier. And what I mean by easier is um, easier to reason about in the sense that um, you can, we can use, <clears throat> You can, we, can, we, can, we can integrate text mining workflows into workflows that you probably are already using in other, um, in other parts of the data analysis that you may be doing, and also, um, uh, um, and also more effective. So this work is based um, on an R package called Tidy Text. So this package is available on CRAN and on, um, on GitHub here. And what the, the, the goal of the Tidy Text package is to provide functions and to provide supporting data sets to, um, to allow you to use the, the suite of, um, to use the, the universe of packages that include um, dplyr, tidyr, broom, and ggplot2, and to, to, take this, to take this suite of tools that, that exist out there and to be able to deal with text with the same a uh, suite of tidyverse tools that, that are there and, and, and to be able to integrate that though the, integrate your text mining into this same um, into this uh, into these same kinds of uh, workflows that you're that you're using here. So so G, uh, so tidy text is here and I'm going to be talking today about how um, what how we can apply this kind of approach to um, to test text mining tasks. So um, how how often would do we approach using text? Um, so if we if we have some kind of text and we want to an, um, analyze it, how do we typically store it? And if you want to read text into R, what are our options or or any um, programming language for that matter. Often, uh, text is, when you first read it in, what you have it, you have it as a character vector or a string, and, and it can just be a raw string there. Or if we have a whole bunch of them, if we have a whole bunch of, of, of things that we consider separate documents, we can put them together in what's called a corpus. Um, maybe we have some metadata. Maybe we have some information about each one of those documents or, or strings, like maybe a, a title or, or some tag or something. And we can put those together and, and call it a corpus. Or maybe you can store information about text in something that's called a document term matrix. So here you have um, a sparse matrix, and each row um, corresponds to a document, and each um, column corresponds to a term or a word, and then you um, you have a value, um, like, a, like a number, like a count, that tells you how many times does each um, word appear in each document. And so there'll be a lot of zeros and then some numbers here and there. These are all data structures that can be used to, um, to deal with text. And they have um, applications and different kinds of algorithms that you might want to use. But none of these are, um, are tidy data structures. So let's talk about what we mean when we talk about tidy data when it comes to text. So for this, for this example, let's take a little bit of a poem by Emily Dickinson. She wrote some lovely text in her time. So let's take a little bit of a poem by Emily Dickinson, and let's go through and talk about converting it to um, a tidy data structure. So what we're going to focus on is the, um, <clears throat> the idea in tidy data of having one observation per row. So let's say, let's take this bit of this poem and let's put it into um, a character vector here and assign it to the object text. If we have, if we say what, what is stored in text, it will just read out like this. We can load the dplyr package and put this into a data frame. And notice how here we have another, we've added another column that, um, that's going to keep track of which line the, um, each line of the poem is from. So now we, we, have, our, we have our text data in a, in a data frame, but this is not yet what we would define as a, as a tidy data structure for text because we, we are not... We need, to, we need to think about what is the observational unit that I'm interested in when it comes to this poem, and I want to end up with one observation per row. Most often when it comes to text, the observational unit that we're interested in is single words. So let's um, load 
the tidy text package, and then let's use um, the unnest tokens function to transform this data fra frame into a into a tidied data frame. Let's um, let here we go. Let's um, use unnest tokens and let's transform so we have one word per row. So notice that before we were reading the poem across, and then after we use unnest tokens from the tidy text package, we're reading the poem down like so. So we have we have transformed from uh, it to a format where we have one word per row. All right, so notice a few things here. Um, we still have that other column that we made ahead of time. We still know which line of the poem each word came from. And we got rid of things like punctuation and the words were converted to lowercase. These are the defaults in um, that, that um, function and that's often a, use, a useful choice for um, analysis that, um, as we move forward, moving forward there. So that was a little wee bit of a little bit of text just to walk you through what we mean when we say what is a, is a tidy data structure for text. Now let's take a bigger chunk of text. Let's take the six published completed novels of Jane Austen and let's tidy that text. So here we go. So the Jane Austen's novels are available in R in the Jane Austen R package. Yes. That's my package, I, I like it. Um, so let's take the Jane Austen R package and then let's load dplyr and string R and set up a data frame here. So what we're, we're, we're saying group by book and then we're counting up some columns uh, to keep track of some things. And the output of that code looks like this. The text column has um, the actual text content of the books and then these other columns are keeping track of things like which book are we in, what, what line number are we on. Line number in this case means uh, like as if we were reading the book, like which line of the book, and then chapter um, is going to count up, and, and line number and, and chapter are going to re reset when we get to a, a new book here. So we have our, our data in a, um, in a data frame. Now let's un use unnest tokens to make a tidy data frame. So notice that as before, we now have one word per row, because we're interested in the single word observational unit here. And notice that now our data frame is much longer. We had we had this many rows, now we have this many rows. So we're converting, we end up with a very long, um, skinny data frame instead of a wide data frame. So congratulations, we tidied our text. Very exciting, right? Um, so why have we done this? What is the point of, of doing this? The, the reason why using tidy, a tidy data approach to text is interesting is because there are te text mining tasks there are natural language processing things that are common to do or that you might want or need to do that become natural extensions of, um, of, of common tidyverse operations. So for example, um, Something that you often need to do when processing text is to remove stop words. Stop words are words that are um, very common uh, in, in English. These are words like a, the, of, to, and. They're words that aren't particularly meaningful in, a, um, in an analysis. And so you often want to take them out of, a, of a, your, your, your data set of words that you're working with before you move forward with an analysis. If your data is in a tidy data structure, then you can use dplyr's anti-join to remove them. And they're gone. And then we can do something like ask the question, what are the most um, common words in Jane Austen's novels? And we can use dplyr's count to find that out. So with just a handful of lines of codes, we can get to this result. What are the most common words in Jane Austen's novels? So those are words like miss, time, dear, lady, sir. And then we see some, some proper names there. We see Fanny, Emma, and Elizabeth. So we're able to get to this, this um, insight very quickly because we um, converted our data to a tidy data structure. Um, uh, so that was based, this is based on counting words, on f words frequency. Another analysis that I've done uh, somewhat recently <laughs> that's based on this is um, based on a different data set, a data set of pop lyrics. So I, I looked, I took a data set of lyrics from um, pop songs that reached uh, uh, the year-end Billboard Hot 100, I think is, is the specific um, the specific data set that it was, and asked the question, what, um, what states are mentioned most often? 
um, in, in pop lyrics. So we can, we can, and then I use that to make a map. So this map actually looks really similar to the one Ramnath was working on earlier, but this is actually made in ggplot2, not with anything um, interactive. So if you, uh, so this is based on um, uh, the, the same, the same uh, kind of question. Let's ask, just, just ask a counting question. So which states are mentioned most often in song lyrics? So here we see that um, a state like California is mentioned the most often. But you might say, well, um, California is a very populous state. So there's a lot of people there who are writing songs to sing about it. Um, so maybe we would prefer to divide by um, the population of the state. And so then we can see which states are mentioned most often in song lyrics relative to their population. And then we see an answer like this. So Hawaii and Montana are mentioned really often relative to how many people live there. And also the states in like the deep south, we see them being mentioned a lot there as well. So this is another example of the kind of analysis you can do um, with text when, when you apply tidy data principles and we can um, uh, convert the raw text to a tidy form and then use things like count and ggplot2 to make visualizations at the end of that. <clears throat> so the next thing I want to talk about is sentiment analysis. So sentiment analysis asks questions about text, about the, um, the, the opinion that is communicated or the emotion that is communicated in it. And sentiment analysis is often done using sentiment lexicons. So sentiment lexicons are, um, are lists of words. They're like a dictionary with a lot of words in it. And the words are assigned some score. So they might be, a sco they might be scored from negative five to plus five based on how um, negative or positive the word is, or they might be, um, they might be uh, scored in a binary fashion, like this is a negative word, or this is a positive word, or this is a joy word, or a fear word. And if you have a, um, a large section of text, you assess the sentiment of the section of text by adding up the sentiment of all the words that make up the text. So um, these, these le sentiment lexicons don't contain all English words, because many English words are rather neutral. So they, they build, people build these lexicons, then you can use the lexicons to, um, to assess the sentiment of, uh, of chunks of text. So um, we said that removing stop words uh, when you have your data in a tidy data structure, you can, you can implement that using an anti-join. If, if your text data is in a tidy data structure, you can implement sentiment analysis using an inner join. So you have your, your text data that you are um, analyzing, you have, your, um, you have your sentiment lexicon, then you do an inner join between them, and what you get out is, of course, the words that are in both of those data sets there. So if, you, if we do an inner join and then have um, just a couple more lines of code about um, we're using count and spread, and we get to a result like this. So this um, shows us through the narrative arcs of the six Jane Austen novels, what sections of the books have more positive sentiment and what sections of the books have more negative sentiment. So we're able to see how, um, how the use of positive and negative words changes through the narrative arc of the book. We are able to get to this kind of um, insight with just a handful of, um, of, of deep plier statements that we are um, able to understand and reason about because we have converted our data to a tidy data format. The sections of um, positive and negative sentiment here uh, correspond to plot events that we as human readers understand as, as being positive or negative things happening. So for example, if you look in Pride and Prejudice, about halfway through Pride and Prejudice where you see that first section of extended section of negative sentiment, it looks like something bad must be happening there. And that is, that's where Mr. Darcy proposes for the first time so badly, and Elizabeth is so offended, and it's, it's super terrible. And that, that, that section about three quarters of the way through Pride and Prejudice, where you see more another large extended section of um, negative sentiment. That's where Lydia elopes with scandalous Mr. Wickham, and it's so terrible. Not, not our Mr. Wickham, you know, but the, the, ba the bad one, the bad one. So we're, we're, able to, um, we're able to get to this um, insight here because of the way we've applied tidy data principles. 
Um, I'm going to blast through that and talk about um, uh, the third topic I wanted to talk about, which is how we can, in a programmatic way, assess what a document is about. So um, uh, one thing we can think about when we talk about what a document is about is term frequency. So term frequency uh, um, asks the question, how often does a document use, use a word? So we say, OK, this document is using this word a lot, so that word is important there. But again, we run into uh, the issue with some common words are not important in, so, in some language, and how are we going to deal with that? A more, a more sophisticated approach than just removing words um, or is called inverse document frequency. And inverse document frequency is a weight. It's a weight that we're going to multiply by something. So the way that inverse document frequency works is, is like so. It's the natural log of a ratio. And it, it, um, it assumes that we have some collection of documents. And it's the ratio of how many documents do you have in your collection divided by how many of the documents have the word that you're interested in. So if you have um, you have your documents and all of them contain some word, then that ratio is going to be 1, and the natural log of that is going to be 0, and so you're going to weight that down. But if you, have, if you have your documents and only a couple of them contain a word or only one of them contain that word, then that ratio is going to be bigger than 1, and that um, natural log is going to be a bigger number. So, so this is a weight that we're going to have, and if you take T at term frequency and you multiply it by inverse document frequency, you get something that's called TFIDF. And it is, um, it's a statistic. It's something that you measure about words in a, in a corpus, in a collection of documents. And the idea of it is it's going to try to measure, it's going to try to identify words that are common and important, but not too common. So, so it's, um, it's, it's going to try to identify words that are important to one document within a collection of documents. Let's see how this works. So first, let's look at term frequency. So here, we can calculate term frequency just with dplyr verbs. So we can go through this kind of some code like so, and we can calculate and get a result like this. So this is for every book and word. How many times does that book use that word, and how many words does the book have it have in total? And so if you divide n by total, that is just exactly what term frequency is. So we can look at the distribution of those, and it looks like this. So we see we see distributions that um, you know we see distributions like this all over the place, right? This is a very common distribution that we see in the world, and in language, it is very common. Um, so we see a lot of words that are used only a few times, and then these very long tails with um, some, some words, very few words that are used many, many times. So this is a distribution of um, how many times words are used in language. So that's term frequency. The, the tidy text package contains an implementation of, um, of TFIDF that is in the function bind TFIDF, and we can implement it like this. <clears throat> and then we can see the output here. So we see for every book and word, what is term frequency, and then what is inverse document frequency, and then TFIDF. Notice here that IDF is zero for all of these words. That's because um, all six of Jane Austen's novels contain the words the, to, and, and of. So the IDF is zero, and TFIDF is zero. If instead we take this data frame and we arrange it so that we can see the words that have the highest TFIDF, that looks like this. And we see these words. If you're familiar with Jane Austen's work, you know who these people are. Even if you're not familiar with Jane Austen's words, work, you can see that these are proper names. These are the names of people and places. So what have we learned here? We've learned that Jane Austen used similar words in her six novels, and that the thing that distinguishes one of her novels from another one of her novels is the, are the proper nouns. It's the names of the people and the places. So that that is, what, that is what TFIDF does for you. It tells you what's an important word in one document compared to a, um, to a collection of documents. Uh, 
<coughs> I um, have been part of the NASA Data Knots program this year, and I've been working on a project to understand NASA data sets. And so I've applied TF-IDF to, um, <coughs> to, uh, to metadata on NASA data sets. And uh, so this is an example of applying the same technique of, of, of doing TF-IDF, but on a very different kind of, um, of data set. So instead of several hundred year old narrative fiction, these are the description titles, these are the description fields for technical data sets. So we have, um, if you look at NASA data sets that are tagged with the tag um, seismology, then the highest, um, the highest uh, TF-IDF words in those description fields are things like risk, haz hazard, and earthquake. But if you look at the data sets that are tagged with, the, with budget, then we see very different high TF-IDF words. And those, so those, there we see things like the Office of Management and Budget, Fiscal and Financial, and so forth. So, so TF-IDF is a flexible and powerful tool that we can apply to very diverse kinds of texts. Um, I think I'm just about out of time, so I will skip that. But I do want to talk about this. We, um, uh, text data does not need to be tidy at all stages of an analysis. Um, using tidy data principles to deal with text is a powerful tool for being able to um, uh, uh, handle data, be able to handle text data and do the kinds of analysis that you want to do. But there are some kinds of machine learning algorithm that, that wants you to have a, um, a document term matrix or something like that. The tidy text package contains functions for converting back and forth between these different kinds of formats. So this allows you to have a, um, a workflow, for example, that would say, let's, let's read in our text, let's do uh, pre-processing and filtering and initial exploratory data analysis using the suite of tidy tools that, um, that have been shown to be so effective for so many people. Then you can um, cast to say a document term matrix and do some uh, machine learning algorithm like topic modeling. And then you can take the output of your statistical modeling procedure and tidy the output. And then you say broom or nggplot2 to um, handle the output there and, and make visualizations of the output of your statistical modeling procedure. So you're able to have um, a, a workflow that, that involves converting back and forth and you can use the power of tidy tools, but you're not, you're not, you don't have to be um, always uh, committed to the idea of using that for in every case. Um, uh, my collaborator, Dave, who is here, and I, um, and who work on this package together, are, are writing a book. Um, so this book is available online uh, in its entirety in, at tidytextmining.com. So, and we're publishing with O'Reilly. We're really excited about that. So it, it is coming out in just a short number of months. Um, this summer, I think, is when it's, when it's looking like it's going to come out. And what this book, what we have set out to do with this book is to, um, to provide resources for people who want to apply this kind of approach to their text mining tasks. So it, apply, it, it um, provides chapters on getting started, on how to do the kind of tasks that you want to do. And then the last several chapters are case studies. So beginning to end um, analyses using real, um, real world data and showing the kinds of questions that you might want to ask and be able to answer using these, um, using this, these approaches. All right, with that, I will say thank you very much.